Welcome to Wake Up Calls. This is Todd Goodwin. My wife Gina and I are board certified hypnotists with years of experience empowering people to enjoy healthier and more fulfilling lives. There's a myth that hypnotists put people to sleep, but the truth is that we wake them up. So many people sleepwalk through life with no clue what causes their emotions and behaviors. They feel like helpless victims of their anxieties, bad habits, and traumas. Fortunately, we've helped thousands of clients to unlearn those issues, often quickly and easily. What if you could know yourself, accept yourself, and value yourself more than ever before? How would that improve every part of your life? It's possible, and it starts now with self-awareness. Our mission is to help you to wake up so you can think better, feel better, and do better. Podcast topics range from health and wellness to relationships to human behavior and psychology. Our conversations are always informative, often controversial, and sometimes entertaining. Get ready. It's time to wake up. Why is is it so so hard hard to to say say goodbye? goodbye? So today we're talking about grief and how grief is really an emotional reaction to your set of beliefs. And we want to provide some insight to help you shift your paradigm or your way of thinking, your model of the world, when it relates to the death of a loved one or really the loss of anything that you hold dear and the resulting emotional response called grief. And in this episode in particular, we're really just going to cover losing a loved one in this case. That's right. Now, the first thing we want to touch on is how you might be thinking, well, no, grief is normal and appropriate and it's almost required when someone dies. After all, pretty it's much, inevitable. Right. Pretty much everyone grieves when someone dies and, and all of that. And yet what's interesting is if you really look at it, that argument holds no water. First of all, there are some cultures around the world that have different beliefs about death and life after death and life, and they have different spiritual beliefs. And we're not in any way talking about religion. We're talking about spiritual, meaning the non-physical realm. Some cultures uh, don't have much of a belief in this. Like the Western world really doesn't have much of a real spiritual belief in our paradigm. It's pretty much materialist, which means you're here and you're dead. Maybe there's a Christian belief where you'll go to heaven or hell, but the reality is once a person's gone, they're gone. But indigenous populations around the world and some Eastern cultures have a belief in reincarnation or some other kind of life. Crossing over, right. Right. Or that... Returning home. Returning home, exactly. So when someone dies, it's something to celebrate. Mm -hmm. And so they don't feel the, the same emotional suffering that we in the Western world do when someone dies. So that's based on belief system. No one's born with a belief about... Well, just like the Mexicans, right? The Day of the Dead and, you know, the Hindus and the Buddhists. With reincarnation and all of that. Exactly. So uh, whereas they might either celebrate death or feel somewhat neutral about it, in the United States and and a lot of Western nations we uh, that are based on Christianity, and then they have this... Uh, sort of bizarre belief where, you know, on one hand, we might think they're going to suffer and go to hell, but we'd like to believe they're going to heaven. But in either case, we're not in contact with them anymore. Or even like, what if you thought they were really good, but if you're really religious and you've got the beliefs about heaven or hell, what if they weren't who you thought they were and they're actually in hell? (laughs) Sure. And since we have no proof of heaven or hell, it's all speculation. And yet again, that's a belief. It's a belief we might identify with if we were raised in a very religious environment. But religion is all based on belief as well. So now that we've covered religion. Yeah. Well, but we're not talking about... (laughs) We're just just kind of calling religion what it is, which Mm. is basically a reflection of certain belief systems. Right. And and many of them are very unhealthy and counterproductive, especially when it comes to death. Uh, We also want to say that when someone you don't like dies, you either feel nothing or you are actually happy they died. So someone dying 
does not necessarily mean that person is going to, that's going to cause you grief. And we're not saying that one is right and one is wrong. It's just what is. So it's important to realize that... According to beliefs. According to beliefs. It's all based on your beliefs and your perceptions. So maybe... So what are the, some of the beliefs that um, hold people back when it comes to losing a loved one? In our society, anyway. So first of all, there's the unhealthy attachment. If we... The, the amount of grief we feel, the amount of emotional suffering we feel when someone dies is directly related to the amount of unhealthy emotional attachment we have. Mm -hmm. And it's normal to be somewhat attached, but the reality is if if someone dies and we feel like our arm has been ripped off uh, emotionally, then that clearly was an unhealthy attachment and is based on the belief that we need that person. Mm -hmm. And therefore the thing that we have, quote, lost is missing and so now we need something we can't have so, kind of like someone who's an addict uh, who is an addict who suddenly is deprived of their behavior or substance or support or support right and then they feel the loss of that and they said i really need that cigarette i really need that alcohol it's not really the cigarette you're looking for it's just the belief that you need it so talk to, what i also think that that you know especially if you know someone's gonna die let's say they're sick or something you know you're gonna grieve at least in our society, you know you're going to grieve. You might already be grieving. What I did learn back then when I lost my mom or perceived loss of my mom was that after she died, it was really bad. Like I didn't expect the grief to be that way. And I had, it was obviously due to um, limiting beliefs I had about the whole notion of death and, and dying and, and, and loss and gain. Mm-hmm. And my perception was extremely lopsided when it comes to when it came down to what I perceived I lost and what I perceived I gained. The gained was like in a negative, <laughs> and yeah. the loss was in the high numbers. Sure, you know, for me. Well, when you were when you originally were grieving the death of your mom, and that was one of the reasons how we actually well we met for uh, six years ago for purposes of helping you. You wanted to shift your career, and you were interested in in hypnosis and all that. So we met and on I that And I happened regard. to have been grieving. And you happened to have been <laughs> grieving. Right. But of course, I have a feeling that, that the amount of suffering you had, and it, which I think we discussed in a separate call, but it was pretty substantial and affected you in so many parts of your life that you didn't have any other reference point. You actually thought mm-hmm. it was normal to cry every day mm-hmm. when someone like your mom mm-hmm. died. I thought that... Um, for two years. Yeah. And it was getting worse. Um, I thought that that was normal. And I thought that I just hadn't learned how to deal with it. So you would agree that you had an unhealthy emotional attachment Absolutely. to her? Absolutely, yeah. Were you aware of that before she died, though? No. And were you even conscious of that before we met, that it was really an unhealthy emotional attachment, no. which was the cause of your grief? No. Thought it was normal. So in a way, you were... I felt like I was being dragged through the dirt, and there was nothing I could do about it but just grin and bear it. <laughs> yeah. So you had you had an unconscious or, or a subconscious belief that you needed your mom in order yes. to be okay. Presumably. Yeah. Subconscious for sure, because I wasn't aware of the, that word for word, but yes. What I find interesting is that when we're children, we do need our parents. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't mean that necessarily goes until we're 18. And I'm not even It's talk- a healthy dependency at that point. Sure. But what happens is you, usually when you're children it is normal to be depend in a state of dependency on your parents. Mm-hmm. Then when we become teenagers, we become more independent. independent. We want to push back against our Tighten relationships it. yeah. because it's sort of like, get away, get away. I can do it on my own. And then when you, when you're in your twenties, <laughs> that's 20s, the whole, I can't tell me what to do phase. <laughs> right. And that's why teenagers are so rebellious. Yeah. And eventually it becomes interdependence, which is a more mature way of where we learn that we can interact with people and rely on them for certain things they rely on us, but we don't. That's when we become friends with our parents. Exactly, but some people never really evolve beyond the dependency or the independence. In other words, there are people who are always rebelling against some perceived authority throughout their life, which may very well be they're pushing back against the energy from their father or something, even after he's died. And so they're always independent. They're always pushing back against everything. That's a maturity glitch right there. They're still adolescent in their mind. And then there are people who are still emotionally dependent on other people 
whether it's a parent or a spouse or someone like that, and they're always leaning on other people for support because their belief is that they can't do it on their own. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think it's interesting. But you said, so you had emotional and emotional mm-hmm. dependency. Mm-hmm. So that's one belief is the unhealthy attachment or that we need someone. What about the idea about you're obligated to mourn? In other words, people say, yeah, but if I stop, if I stop grieving. I was almost afraid to stop crying because I thought it meant that I didn't miss her anymore. And if I didn't miss her anymore, did that mean I didn't love her anymore? Does that mean that the love faded? And then comes the wait, the horror. How could that be? This is my mother. I'm supposed to always love my mother. That could bring up a whole nother set of beliefs. But um, yeah, you think that the harder you grieve, the harder you love. Sure. And that's a that's kind of a self-inflicting hurt, you know? Um, it's almost uh, masochistic in a way. True. Because the longer time went on, weeks, months, uh, the worse the grief got. It's almost like I was digging a hole deeper and deeper and trying to fill it with what I perceived I'd lost. And so it just became this big black dark hole (laughs) that Mm -hmm. got bigger and stronger like a storm. Um, I think part of it is also I had the superhero mentality, which is delusional. And that can happen when someone very important in your life is is sick or there's something wrong or they're going to die. Uh, you want to save them. And you have this huge inflated ego that you can save someone, you know. <laughs> and then um, I think that the fact that I felt I couldn't save her really hit me hard. And I guess it was just a lot of guilt. You are trying to save her because you believe you need her. Yeah. And if she can't save herself, you need to save her. So that she can save you. So I, I was trying to save myself. Right. Which is... Shit. Shit. So re- <laughs> which comes back to a, a premise that guilt is primarily a selfish emotion. Where we're looking at... We're, we're really unconsciously yes, focused on what we've lost. completely selfish. Because we're focusing... Exactly. We're focusing on everything we... I, I don't have anymore. Everything became I. You know, someone would ask me, what, what, what is it that, that you're so upset about losing your mom? Well, I'll never feel her hug me again. I'll never hear her voice again. I'll never um, get another home-cooked meal. Sure. Um, And so everything is I. Everything is I, I, I. Everything is I won't have this. I won't have that. Now I'm stuck with this. Now I'm stuck with that or whatever it is. So you're really mourning your own, what you perceive that you lost. And so a lot of it is And all the mess I gained. Exactly. Yeah. Although all perspective, it is. These are all beliefs, but it's interesting because there's another one that is not selfish, but is also based on a belief that is based in no reality, which is our loved one when they die ceases to exist in any form, and that they will suffer, and so we feel bad for them that now they're burning in the lake of fire or in hell or some (laughs) other. Or you wonder if they if they are. You know? Well, right. So, but in other words, we we since we believe that we uh, they don't exist anymore, at least in any realm we can connect to, then we're left with this uncertainty. And especially if we have some, in my opinion, warped belief about someone burning in hell for whatever sins they've committed, then you know, hey, what if they're a Catholic and they died before they could get to confession? Guess what? They're gonna burn. Mm-hmm. It brings to light your own awareness of your mortality. And so mm-hmm. if you think that this person's not just going to die, but something awful spiritually is going to happen to them, then, oh my God, well, what if that happens when I die? Mm-hmm. So really the, the fear of losing someone it makes else it real. becomes a fear of losing, of dying on your own. The other thing is it may not be hell. It could be maybe they, they are now spirits and they're wandering the, the earth as a, as a lost soul. And, <laughs> I mean, no, these but people yeah. believe these things, and and whether they're true or not, we can't know for sure. But we do know that certain that these beliefs create unnecessary emotional suffering. And I can tell you, at least with me personally, I'm a very open-minded spiritual person, and I still had a big problem with um not the whole heaven or hell thing, but I st- I, I was so focused on what I didn't have anymore. I had a big problem, even. Though I I believe in certain things and in my heart I know she's fine, I still was grieving and it was getting worse and worse. And it was because of what I perceived I didn't have anymore. Mm-hmm. So that that brings us to the... Selfish. 
Yeah, and that brings us to the fourth. Well, there have been more than four, but but the four main beliefs, you know, one, that you believe you need the person, so that's the unhealthy attachment. Two, that you're obligated to mourn in order to honor or love them. Three, that they will suffer or that they're trapped and they're non-existent and you can't get to them. And if only you could tell them to go towards the light or whatever, <laughs> you know. know. But then the fourth one is that you are no longer connected in any way to this person who has died and they're not available to you in any way, which which means it's almost like, hey, we interacted a lot. I could always pick up the phone or whatever. But now we just know that once they're physically gone, that we have no connection. And it's like we've now missed our opportunity to say goodbye or to talk with them. Or make amends. Or make amends, exactly, which is where guilt and things like that mm -hmm. come in. So, so talk about that in terms of what are you really missing and is it true that you're not in any way connected? And what is it when they die that you're really grieving? Well, what I perceived I lost, I think, was your first... What was the first thing you asked? Well, I was saying was that... A, that was a three-parter. <laughs> well, there's a belief that you're not connected any longer to that person and they're not in any way available to you. And the other part of that is, is it really the person that you're grieving the loss of or something else? I think when you're in it, you're, you believe you're grieving the person. And I believe that when you're in it, you probably feel the connections lost because you're so in this dark space that you can't see past that. It's really hard to see past it. And so even with me being extremely open-minded and very open spiritually, I, I wasn't sure how I could connect with her or if it would even work. You know, it was almost like questioning everything I've always believed. It's like, all right, well, here's someone who passed away. Let's see uh, what all the hype is about if you talk out loud to them or if you, you know. But I think that looking back, especially after I've had some shifts in perspective and um, really doing the work and getting honest with myself, what am I missing? Well, after I did some work with uh, one of our mentors, uh, Dr. John Demartini, and with you as well, Todd, I realized that a lot of what I was missing was things about her that I loved or enjoyed or admired or found funny. The traits, the qualities she had. Mm -hmm. And if you just have an open mind for a moment, is it possible that when we perceive the loss of those traits in someone, well, then that could only mean that those traits and qualities are transferred into other people that show up into your life. Is it possible? I can tell you from my perspective that, yes, it is absolutely true uh, for me. Um, I see it as truth. Dr. Demartini says it's true. Uh, it, done, it's a subject I'd like to I, I like to play with. You know, I like to play with the things that he's done. Well, he's done a tremendous amount of research on it. So for him, it's an absolute right. undeniable fact that it's based on it's not so much in the metaphysical world and energy as I understand his position on it. It's not that quantum things. No, it, are... it's not about that. It's about our perception. So in other words, right. we perceive a, a, mo a mother figure, let's say. Right. And when she dies, we're still who looking... Who showed up? At, we're, who showed up, but we're still looking at that same empty table at the, cha at the, at the empty chair at the table. And we're like, she's not sitting there anymore. I wish she would sit there. But Why is we're she not... failing to see... Someone else has taken a seat across from her. We're not seeing it. In other words, when one door closes, another one opens. Right. But it's not in the metaphysical realm we're talking about so you don't need to believe in woo woo stuff it is our this is perception stuff that's been proven we have right we have a need based on what we've learned to feel whole that we need a mother figure right and if that mother figure is no longer with us in our normal perception we still are projecting a need to have a mother figure and it will be replaced by one person Two people, ten people, male, female, younger, older, doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be a mother. If I'm honest with myself and I look back and I say, okay, well, around that time, who stepped in like a mother figure with that kind of energy that, that, that comforted you the same way or spoke to you in a similar fashion? And it doesn't even have to be someone who's related to, to, to them. But in this case, it was um, my grandmother, her, my mom's mom, and her sister, mm -hmm. my aunt. So those two stepped in and although we'd had a good relationship, we started talking more often and still do years later um, and really built a bond. And so they remind me so much of her. So then that trait came through 
through other people. So it makes it less sad. Right. And you, you can look... Because you can't deny that. You know, you can't deny that those people came through. If you're still going to grieve the person and, and grieve that that person's face is not at the dinner table, then you may have a, a, a hidden agenda. <laughs> that... Right. So we'll touch on that in a sec. But so basically what you're saying is it's it changes form. Correct. The trait is still conserved, but it shows up in a different way or a different Correct. person might might be go from one to many or something like right. that. Right. Another thing I missed a lot was a home cooked meal. And although I know how to make some of them, the whole aspect of having somebody in the household that you love to make you a nice home cooked meal, uh, made with love. <laughs> uh, I don't have that with her anymore, but I found I have that with you. There you go. <laughs> you make a lot of home cooked meals. Yeah, that's right. So let's be clear about this. When someone when someone you love dies and you're grieving, you're not grieving their flatulence. You're not grieving their <laughs> their bad breath. You're not br- br- uh, grieving their uh, messiness. Their bad habits. Right. I mean, oh, I wish my mom could just, you know. I wish my mom could snoop through my stuff one more time. <laughs> yeah, you don't think that. You don't think that. So I wish I could get grounded one more time. <laughs> exactly. So we're not grieving the loss of the person. We're grieving the loss of the qualities or traits or attributes or characteristics that we like. Admired, yeah. Not the ones we don't like. We're happy. So, you know, as Demartini often says, when whenever someone dies, there is both grief and relief. In other words, let's just say the person had a really annoying voice, but they were very sweet. So you are you are grieving the loss of their sweetness and kindness, but you are relieved that you don't have to hear that annoying voice constantly. I mean, I'm exaggerating. Mm-hmm. You're not like, well, I miss her. I'm, I'm, no, you don't. You miss the things you liked. You're grateful you no longer have the things you don't like. So the point is when we, when someone dies, very often we, we have this perception, a lopsided perception that gets crystallized in, in solid form where we're seeing more positive than negative. And then as a result, uh, we just continue to compare our current reality with this fantasy that we're trying to cling on to. And that's what creates the sadness and the grief. Mm-hmm. Now, I do want to say one thing. Talk about secondary gain, something you know a lot about. You've written a paper about it because uh, you said you may have a hidden agenda. So let's just say, Gina, someone's listening to this and saying, you know what? This is bullshit. Uh, grief is normal, healthy. You have to. Obligated. Or, yeah, I'm required to grieve. Don't try to tell me I can just change how I'm thinking. You know, I'm supposed My to be able to My therapist tells me that it's it's healthy to grieve. Yeah, and, I'll, and I'm going to be in a grief support group for three years until I get over it. <laughs> okay, so that bullshit aside... What's your opinion on that? And if someone is defending a disempowering and suffering mindset? I would say if someone just can't see past it, even if someone hears what we're saying and uh, understands it yet doesn't want to see it for themselves, you know, let's just say they're not even being rude about it. Like, no, you have to grieve. Like, let's just say they're not even being aggressive about it, about defending how they feel they're just not ready to really change that. Or maybe they feel that if they're not grieving, they're going to be letting that person go and they don't want to let that person go yet. Sure. Which is all still belief. Yeah. I think that with having a payoff or what's called a secondary gain, which is almost like an alternative gain. Right. So it's a benefit you get from being Being in a problem state. Yeah. Right. So you get enormous sympathy and attention with that. It's like you're seeking enormous attention because of what happened to you. Right. So one of the things you could be seeking is connection, because if you're holding on to your loss, you're probably somehow connecting and getting a lot of sympathy and attention from your family. True. So it's like the more you hold on to that loss, the more attention you're probably going to receive. And today you can get it on Instagram and Facebook. Social media is huge with that. People reinforcing your need for emotional support. Which is also based on a disempowered belief that you can't handle it. And so you need other people to support you. So this goes even, this goes beyond support. This goes, this is basically just attention beyond anything else. Sure. Or, or by the way, avoidance of responsibility. So uh, Mm -hmm. secondary gain usually is you you unconsciously are, are holding on to pleasure, comfort, support, and pushing away discomfort, hassle, and responsibility. So let's just say someone is grieving and they're suffering and they're crying all the time. They can, at a very unconscious level, make a pretty good case to their spouse, family, or friends that, you know what, I can't really make dinner tonight because I'm grieving, or you know what, I can't take out the trash, or can you please do the whatever work that, because I'm still suffering. And of course, 
the or per- perhaps even not even go back to work it's like i don't sure. want to work i just want to be home yeah so and the reality is when someone has a secondary gain it makes it harder to resolve the apparent issue because they're getting paid not literally necessarily rewarded unless they're on disability for they're being getting depressed. rewarded right they're being rewarded for staying stuck, stuck and having the problem and so if you know, why and that you... can be addicting. Uh, absolutely. In fact... Uh, and the... it's really just compensating. Whether you're seeking emotional support for attention, uh, overeating, drinking, or developing bad habits as a result of grief, you're really just compensating. Yeah. And of course, I would say that you know when someone is doing that, and you did a lot of that in the, in the wake of your mom's death, that those are unconscious attempts as are all emotionally compulsive behaviors and and bad habits, I guess you can say. They're all unconscious or subconscious attempts to feel a little better or to get some kind of instant quick pleasure because there's a lack of ongoing fulfillment or sense of wellness. In other words, if you didn't feel so low, you wouldn't have to get so high. Exactly. With the sugar or the nicotine or the marijuana or the alcohol or whatever it might be, these attempts to get high are compensating for our lowness. And the lowness is all based on the belief that something bad has happened in our life or that something is wrong. If you were to, you may say, well, I don't really believe that. So then I'll, I'll ask you, if you don't, I'm talking to our listener here. If you don't believe it, it doesn't matter because you got to believe something. And, and the reality is we don't know for sure Martini is absolutely 100% convinced because he's, he's worked with tens of thousands of people with these issues. We've worked with, you know, thousands, but he's absolutely sure. I can say it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. What's true for you? If you believe any of those disempowering beliefs, then you're going to continue to suffer. So the question is, do you want to continue to suffer? And since everything in our reality is really based on our perception, what do you want to perceive that's going to allow you to live a healthier, more fulfilling life. And I want to mention one last thing, and I'd like your opinion as we close, Gina. Our beliefs, because our belief systems dictate our emotional responses, when we have symptoms, perhaps health-related symptoms, they can very well be caused by our beliefs. So if someone is suffering from chronic grief, as one example, based on their toxic beliefs about death and life, and they're suffering emotionally, they can weaken their immune system. They can manifest illnesses. Yeah. I When I was grieving before I got help for it to shift my belief system, I was 29 years old and I was having heart palpitations. My heart would stop and start, stop and start. Um, I, I mean, the crying was every single day. Almost every night I'd wake up in the night and just cry into my pillow. Uh, I would wake up with spasms where I couldn't move my head or my neck and I could barely go to work, couldn't sleep. The anxiety was through the roof. I had, I was taking Unisom. I, I was drinking. I, sometimes it was two Unisoms. <laughs> sure. Uh, and still I would wake up in the night. I guess that's, those were my physical symptoms. Um, I had tension throughout my whole body. So when we worked together six years ago, yeah, yeah, we used a variety of different methods to dissolve the grief. We used Demartini's method, we used hypnosis, we used neuro-linguistic programming, because you also had a lot of PTSD and trauma, mm-hmm. not just the grief. Memories, yep. Right, so really, if what you are seeing and hearing in your memory causes an emotional reaction, a, an unpleasant, un, you know, toxic emotional reaction or physical reaction, mm-hmm. then the solution really is simple as changing what you see and hear in your memory. And this Mm -hmm. is one of the ways that we resolve trauma. And I just want to say it doesn't change, it doesn't change the facts. You know, when you do stuff, when you do work like this with someone, it doesn't change what happened. I still know what happened. I know what I saw. But when I try to picture some, (laughs) I still laugh about it. When I try to picture some of the memories, they're just so screwed up. It just makes me kind of laugh that that was creating so much grief. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> well, and those were memories of when she was dying from cancer in the hospital oh, yeah. and all that. Oh, yeah. Those things that brought tears. They were bad. Right. But yeah, those memories used to fly into my head with no warning. 
and I would have to fight tears wherever I was, whether I was working or driving on the highway. Sometimes I'd have to pull over because that memory would just pop into my head and, and boom, a huge emotional reaction I couldn't even control. And we worked together and in a few, two or three sessions, you couldn't even get those pictures it back was really, in your head. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember in the past before you and I worked together, I would look at pictures of her on, on Facebook or something or, or saved on my computer. I was so focused on her being sick and ill I would focus on the ones where she had already been diagnosed and then I, I would skip over the ones before she was diagnosed when she was healthy. And then after a few sessions with you, I think especially after the, the session we did a lot of NLP with, with the, the PTSD and everything, mm -hmm. I found myself one day, one of those days in between the sessions skipping over the pictures where she was sick wearing a wig and focusing on the pictures where she was actually healthy and truly happy and i thought whoa that's a shift sure. i used to focus on her being sick and now i was focusing on her being healthy and remembering her healthy instead of remembering her sick mm -hmm. and that was huge for me sure because i i, I wished i could remember her that way and 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 now i i can yeah. So we're going to leave you with, with a very simple technique that you can use that's really just one part of, of you know, one small fraction of the, the work that, that we did together, you and I. Um, but also, whenever resolving grief, one simple thing you can do, as we alluded to earlier, is to identify, say, five qualities or traits about that person that you most miss and that you perceive uh, you wish you had. You know, like their laughter, their their mothering instinct, their ability to listen. Then ask yourself, where else did it show up when they died? It's about your perception, your perceived need for them to be a certain way becomes unfulfilled when they're gone. So your need is still there and you're just going to map it onto someone else or onto several people. So ask yourself for those, each of those traits that you wish you still had that you perceive missing the positive traits, let's say, where in your life did, did they show it? up? Yeah. Where did they gain? It could be someone you work with that you've known for years. And sure. then all of a sudden you notice something about them you never did because maybe they both had that quality always, but you never noticed it in the person you work with because you were always focusing on the person you lost or perceive you lost anyway. Right. And so now you're noticing, hey, the person I work with kind of sounds like that person or, or they say the same phrase that they used to tell me when I was a little girl. Those people, they don't have to be the same gender. It could be male or female, one or many, mm -hmm. uh, near or distant. It can be even real or imagined. In other words, it can be in your mind in your mind, you can still have conversations with them. That counts. It doesn't have to be real. It can be virtual. And it can also be yourself. Like you mentioned your mom's right. laugh. Uh -huh. You laugh kind of like she does, uh -huh. did. I notice her laughter in me much more now than before. And it was probably always there. I just never noticed it. So that's cool. Exactly. So uh, find alternatives, alternative sources. Where else those traits that you missed showed up and keep writing examples, dozens, until you are convinced that they still exist in some way, even if they've changed since then. I'm going to add something to that, Todd, and say, I'm going to go a little out on a limb here. It's a little controversial, maybe. Careful, don't lose your balance. Um, <laughs> write down, you could probably think of 10 things you've lost or disadvantages of the person being gone. Don't write those down. Write down advantages, things that you can be grateful for. And that's the real head turner because if it hadn't happened the way it happened with my mom, I wouldn't be where I am today, doing what I'm doing, living where I'm living, being married to who I'm married to, uh, having the career I enjoy with helping people uh, without having to drug them. <laughs> right. Um, and I can be so grateful because if it weren't for that eye-opening experience, um, I'd still be at some dead end job in the corporate world trying to just work my way up and probably just be miserable. Um, so I can be grateful for it. You know, I lost one, but now I can probably help hundreds or even thousands avoid getting an illness or a disease that compromises your immune system or, or, or something like that, because I think that's something she'd be really proud of, you know? So am I happy she died? No. Am I grateful? Yeah. 
It's interesting. That's an interesting uh, distinction because when we first met uh, over coffee. Oh, I said there's no f- right. freaking way I could ever be grateful for it. There's, I, I said I, it sounded too good to be true. Right, because I just said, well, what if you could end up feeling grateful that she died of cancer and that she died? I think that was the first time I laughed about her dying in a long time. <laughs> when you said that to me, I think I laughed. Right. I and said, that's, not, that's not possible. And then I said, why is it not possible? And I said, because it sounds too good to be true. And yet. Here I am. And so it is. And so it is. All right. (laughs) All right. Well, uh, this was a long one, but worth it. So remember, now you know why it's so hard to say goodbye. And sometimes when you say goodbye, you're not really saying goodbye. Because the person remains in your heart and you're able to feel that sense of love, then really they're not gone at all. And if you open your eyes, you'll notice that a lot of those traits you loved and admired in them do show up in other ways, in other people, just, you know, keep your eyes and mind and heart open and you'll see it. And if you don't see it and are choosing not to see it, and it's been a while, you might want to ask yourself if there's something that you're benefiting from staying stuck. Mm -hmm. Because you might not even be aware of it. Yeah. And the thing that I know that you have told me you found was when all of the emotional suffering was cleared out of the way, you were able to be more present with your feeling of love Mm -hmm. for your mom. You could feel the love from Mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that's really happening on a spiritual level or it's just in your perception, ultimately doesn't matter. Either way, it's nice. Exactly. So it's hard to still feel the love for someone when your entire self is clouded by emotional suffering. You're so wrapped up in in your own selfishness with grief, you know? For sure. uh, Until that's cleared out. um, It's really hard to love. Yeah. To feel the love. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll talk to you next time. Bye. Ciao. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please share it with others who might benefit too. Follow our podcast at www.goodwinwakeupcalls.com to be notified as new episodes are released. If you have questions or topics you'd like us to address, email wakeupcalls at goodwinhypnosis.com. And visit GoodwinHypnosis.com if you'd like our help to overcome a personal challenge. We'll talk to you soon.